Tonight is the 27th uh, of Rajab, <clears throat> 1,443 lunar years after the Hijrah of our Master Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I'm going to talk about one of the uh, greatest uh, miracles, greatest mu'jizat of our Master Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a miracle of the night journey and ascension. So this is called Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj. Uh, and much of what I will mention um, is similar to uh, something I briefly presented uh, last year when I did a recording from my house. But tonight I'm going to expand a little bit uh, on that, inshallah, and then uh, even take some questions if you have any questions, inshallah ta'ala. So even though there are numerous miracles attributed uh, to the prophets, al-anbiya in general, there are a select uh, few that only he, sallallahu alayhi wa received. So these are from the khasa'is, of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. These are the unique qualities of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So no one before him received them, and no one after him will ever receive them. So they're only for him. So the first one is the wahi of the Quran, the revelation of the Quran. The Quran is the final revelation of God. It supersedes all of the previous revelations, the injunctions, the ahkam of the Quran. Uh, supersede all of the previous revealed injunctions. Okay, in in the Torah there are there are six hundred and thirteen, what are called mitzvot or commandments. These are awamir and nawahi prescriptions and proscriptions. In other words, six hundred and thirteen do's and don'ts. Yet only about forty uh, percent, uh, sorry, um, about sixty percent of them can actually be applied in the world uh, today because 40% of them are predicated upon the existence of the priesthood and the temple and the sacrificial system at the temple, and all of those things are gone. And they've been gone for the last 2,000 years. So the, the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, the, what we would call the irada kawniya, in effect abrogated 40%, 40% of the ahkam of the Torah. So they're abrogated as a circumstance of history. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw it fit for those ahkam to be rendered obsolete. So this is compelling evidence. It's circumstantial evidence, but still evidence uh, that the Torah was never meant to be the last and universal sacred law for humanity. Uh, that something else would be coming and that someone else would be coming. Another messenger similar to Musa alayhi salam would be coming. And of course, there are certain uh, immutable theological and uh, ethical uh, principles and foundations. So we call these usul and maqasid. Immutable means unchanging theological and ethical uh, principles and foundations that all of the prophets uh, affirmed. Uh, however, the religion found its uh, ikmal, like its uh, completion or perfection, with the revelation given to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, which include the Quran and the Prophet's sunnah, in other words, uh, the prophets firmly established ethos and practice. So that's, that's one of his khasais, right? Is he was given the wahi of the Quran as the final revelation. There's no more wahi because he's the final nebi, right? And then the splitting of the moon, okay? And, and there's many others, but these are the three major ones. And the Isra wal Mi'raj, the night journey and ascension. And this is in, uh, in soul and body, the ruh and the jasad. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, in the ayat were recited in Salatul Isha, Qari Amar, may Allah preserve him. Subhana ladhi asra bi abdihi, this is how the ayah begins in Suratul Isra, also called Bani Israel. It begins with Subhan, and Subhan denotes tanzih and tasbih. So the utter dissimilarity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his absolute perfection, as well as his glory and majesty, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not bound or dependent upon anything, such as uh, time, space, or matter. There's nothing like Allah whatsoever. The six directions cannot contain him, uh, up, down, left, right, front, back. Uh, he, he's neither moving nor still. So our dialectical uh, theologians, uh, they also mention that he is neither transcendent nor imminent with respect to his uh, creation. So he, he utterly crashes 
the logic barrier. He is the first without a beginning. He is the last without an end. He is the necessary existent who created space, time, and matter uh, ex nihilo, out of nothing, not as a necessary or compelled effect to a cause, but rather freely as an act of will. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to create, and his act of creating does not affect his perfection. One iota. Okay? Subhanallah asra bi abdihi. Glory be to the one who took his servant, Abd. Right? This is a reference to our Master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now he is called Abdullah, and one of the greatest titles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in, in the previous dispensations uh, that are still there in, in the Bible, as well as in the Quran, this is his greatest title. Many times in the Quran, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will refer to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his Abd, and this is a high maqam. Alhamdulillah ladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitabah. Praise be to the one who revealed the kitab to his Abd, his servant. تبارك الذي نزل الفرقان على عبده right? فأوحى إلى عبده ما أوحى and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to his slave, his servant whatever he revealed um, so the Prophet sallallahu he perfected this ubudiyya this servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this was demonstrated just before the Isra right? uh, when the Prophet sallallahu he visited the city of Ta'if and he was uh, stoned out of the city, um, and he sought refuge in an orchard, and he was covered in blood, sallallahu alayhi wa And he made a beautiful dua, as you know, Allahumma ashku ilayka da'afa quwwati. This is how he began the dua. Oh, I, oh Allah, I complain to you of the weakness of my strength. Right? So the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi he complained about himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not complain uh, about Allah to Allah. He complained about himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was a beautiful dua. You can read it in the books of Sirah. At the end of the dua, he said that if this is happening to me and you're not angry with me, fala ubali, then that's okay. I'm okay with it. I don't mind. His, his only concern was if he had incurred the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, he is Habibullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And of course, he said, the affair of the mu'min is always good. Ajaban li amr al-mu'min, inna amrahu kullahu khair. He said, the affair of the believer is always good. And then he goes on, if he's in hardship, he's patient. And if there's prosperity, he has gratitude. Right? Sabr and shukr, these are two of the greatest theological virtues in our tradition. Now, the ayah continues, Subhanallah Haram. So glory be to the one who took his servant on a journey by night to the sacred mosque, okay, or the inviolable mosque, sometimes translated. This is the Kaaba in Mecca. The ancient name of Mecca was Becca. Okay, and this is uh, this is something that the Quran informs us of. The Quran has direct access to history. Right? Uh, in awwala baytin wudi ali nasi bi bakkata mubaraka the first house ever established for the worship of the one true true god was a bakka full of blessings this is in surah ali imran i believe it's ayah number 96 and bakka is mentioned in the psalms which is in the tanakh the hebrew bible some of the ulama say that these are the uh, these are the um, the uh, writings of the prophet dawud alayhi salam allahu alam there's some really interesting things in the psalms but there's one Psalm 84, how lovely are your tabernacles, and the word here in Hebrew for tabernacles is mishkanot, which is in the plural, oftentimes it's translated in the singular, but this is actually in the plural. How lovely are your places of worship, what joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So you have this description of pilgrims uh, going to Jerusalem, they're passing through different places of worship, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a well. They pass by some valley called Baca, which means the weeping valley. Of course, this is where Ismail salam, was weeping, and where the Zamzam well um, came into being. So this is something that's mentioned in Psalm uh, 84. 
in the books of Ahlul Kitab, Allahu Alam. We cannot confirm nor deny, but this certainly sounds like something that is a reference to, to Mecca. And then he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 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 Subhanahu wa Glory be to the one who took a servant on a journey by night from the sacred mosque to the farthest mosque um, whose precincts we did bless in order to show him some of our signs. Indeed, he is all hearing and all seeing. So as the story goes, the Prophet Sallallahu was sleeping in the house of Umhani, the sister of Sayyidina Ali, and the archangel Gabriel, Jibril alayhi salam, appears and takes him to the Kaaba, and his chest was split and sealed. It's called Shaq al-Sadr. The heart was placed on ice, a type of open heart surgery, if you will. The incision scar was seen by Sahaba, and something called the Haddu Shaitan was removed from his heart. Imam al Subki, he says, it was a portion of mercy that he had for the Shaitan because he is Rahmati lil Alameen. So this was removed from his heart, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Jibreel alayhi salam then takes the Prophet sallallahu to the Buraq. And this is something, of course, Richard Dawkins famously ridiculed our belief in the Burak uh, while he was being interviewed by Mehdi Hassan. So Mehdi Hassan, he said that he believed in the Burak and uh, Dawkins said something like, are you serious? This is ridiculous and so on and so forth. So Dawkins is a mustahzi, right? There's a term for this type of people. It's called a mustahzi, a mocker, right? So this is what they do. They mock, they scoff, right? And the Quran tells us about people like this. In many ayat, inna kafayna kal mustahzi'in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I will take care of these mockers, right? Don't engage with them. And of course, Dawkins is the same man who says that, you know, we're all apes and uh, life on earth may have been created by aliens and that there's no such thing as objective good and evil. So on his atheistic worldview, we are all just fizzing stardust, and that's how they put it, uh, with no purpose, just um, like atoms moving around aimlessly. So, you know, if I kill my neighbor, th there's nothing essentially wrong with that on materialistic atheism or on Darwinian evolution. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just I uh, atoms colliding with other atoms. There's no moral component to that. Like one of my teachers, he said, it's like a stone rolling down a hill, right? There's no real objective moral component to a stone striking the earth, right? And likewise, on atheism, there is no real objective moral component to my knife stabbing my neighbor. It's just stardust. How can, you know, these atoms and fizzing stardust particles have moral responsibility while the, the ones over here do not. It doesn't make any sense. Atheism is fundamentally non-moral. It doesn't deal with morality. On atheism, everything is just a subjective social convention, okay, unguided and blindly indifferent, as Dawkins says. These are his words. Okay, now the Burak was not from this world. Okay, the Burak was from the Barzakh. This is an intermediate realm. It was a special creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it had the ability to travel at a very high speed, as if moving at the speed of light. In fact, barq is related to barq, which means lightning. And it took uh, 30 days at that time to travel from the Hijaz to Sham, right? Today it takes an hour by airplane. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over time and space. Now, hypothetically, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had manifested an aircraft uh, behind the mountains of Mecca and the Prophet sallallahu flew to Jerusalem and back in one night, the Quraysh would still not have believed him and still would have continued to ridicule him. You know, if you try to explain an email, what an email is to a pre-modern man, uh, he would not believe you or think you were crazy or ridicule you. You know, I can talk to another person who lives on the other side of the world in an instant. Say, what are you talking about? The point is that time and location, uh, that is to say context in general, change our perception of reality. 
Okay, our context is a major determinant of our perception of reality. Okay, so like on Earth, I weigh 200 pounds. Okay, on Mars, I weigh 76 pounds. I'm 40 something years old on Earth, 44 years old on Earth, not as old as I look. On Mars, I would be 24 years old. Maybe we should move to Mars, Michelle. young man again. So mass is relative, time is relative. The closer you get to the event horizon of a black hole, the slower time becomes. The faster you travel, the slower time becomes. This is called time dilation. And our mother Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said the bed was still warm when the Prophet sallallahu returned. The latch of the door was still swinging when he returned. So natural law, okay, what's known as al-hukum al-adi, natural law, or you can call it the laws of physics, the customary laws of time and space were suspended by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the Prophet sallallahu Okay, this was to demonstrate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things. Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Okay. There's no such thing as natural causation according to our dialectical theologians. There's no such thing as natural causation. There are only patterns of the divine will in the created world. And this is also known as the sunnah of Allah. The sunnah of Allah. A miracle then is a suspension of the sunnah of perceived causation, right? A suspension of the psychological construct that we call cause and effect. Okay? This is our theology. According to the theology of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the direct and sole cause of everything in creation. Nature in and of itself has no power to do anything. In every microsecond of existence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is destroying and recreating the atoms and accidents of all things in creation. That God continually creates from moment to moment. Nothing other than Allah has any causal potency or power in reality. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. This is what it means. And this is demonstrated in the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam in the Quran. When Sulaiman alayhi salam asked his counsel to bring him the, the throne of Bilqis, the queen of Saba, right? The Quran says in Ifrit min jinn a very powerful jinn, said, I can bring it to you before you rise from the majlis in a couple of hours, right? It's like, today we can do that in a couple of hours. I can fly from Jerusalem to, to Sana'a, you know, and, and load something into the plane and bring it back in a few hours. But then the Quran says, but someone who had ilmul kitab, Someone who had knowledge of the book, and kitab means revelation. Ilm al-kitab, knowledge of revelation, meaning he had ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, I'll bring it to you before the twinkling of your eye. And the ulama say, how did he do this? He turned to dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the atoms and accidents of the throne of the queen of Sheba, and in the next instant recreated them in Jerusalem in front of the majlis. This is very easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so this is a complicated theological issue that deals with, you know, these 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 uh, weird terms: Aristotelian hylomorphism, you know, atomism, occasionalism, concurrentism, um, uh, human free will, primary and secondary causation. This is heavy duty stuff, right? And this is outside the scope of this lecture. The point is, a break in natural law is called kharkul adat. Okay, it is, is not customary, but it is not irrational. Our belief is not irrational. Our beliefs are not what mockers like Richard Dawkins make them out to be. So he's not a theologian, he's not a philosopher. His caricature of religion is woefully reductionist, right? He thinks we're all like simple minded, like backwater village idiots, right? And a lot of people think this, but they don't understand. You know, that this is a deep, deep religious, theological, and philosophical tradition. If I said that a saint of God walked through a wall, a skeptic might say, well, that's impossible. That's irrational to believe that. I would disagree. It is not customary. 
not customary. At the subatomic level, the quantum level, this happens all the time. According to physicists, it's called quantum tunneling. We just don't know about it. And some physicists believe that this may eventually be possible with larger man-made objects. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the physics of everything. He is the master of creation. He's well acquainted with every type of creation. Okay. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that um, the precincts of Masjid al-Aqsa have barakah in this ayah. Barakah. And the ulama mentioned this is due to the number of prophets, al-anbiya, that uh, resided in that area in and around the land of Sham. It's a very, very blessed place. Hundreds, if not thousands of prophets born and died in this land. Also, according to the sound hadith, the descent of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam will be in the land of Sham. Okay? So there's a hadith here uh, related to Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. It's in the Sunan of An-Nasai. It's graded as a Hassan hadith. So he says that, he says that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he said, it was brought to me a beast bigger than a donkey, but smaller than a mule. And um, his stride would reach as far as his eyesight. So I mounted it with Jibreel alayhi salam. And he said, Inzil, fasalli. So he said, Get down. So I prayed. Get down and pray. So I did that. And he said, Atajri, aina salaita. Do you know where you prayed? Uh, salaita. So he said, you have prayed in Tayba, which is Yathrib, which is Medina Tul Manawara, where you will make Hijrah. And then he said, and then he continued the journey. And he said, Inzil Fasalli, again, dismount and pray. Fasalaitu, the Prophet said, so I prayed. And he said, Atadri Aina Salait, do you know where you've uh, prayed? Salaita Bitur, Bitur Sinai. You have prayed at Mount Sinai. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam. And they continue. And then he said to me, Inzil uh, fasalli. He said, Dis dismount and pray. And he said, So if, uh, I, dis I dismounted and I prayed. And Jibreel alayhi salam said to me, Atajri aina salait. Do you know where you prayed? And he said, You have prayed bi baytil lahmi. You have prayed at Bethlehem. So now they're in Palestine, where Isa alayhi salam was born. And then he said, ثُمَّ دَخَلْتُ بَيْتَ الْمَقْدِسِ فَجُمِعَ عَلِيَ الْأَنْبِيَ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّلَامِ And then he said that I entered the uh, Bayt al-Maqdis, the Temple Mount area in Jerusalem, and prophets were gathered for me. فَقَدَّمَنِي جِبِيلَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ and Jibreel alayhi salam pushed me forward hatta amamtuhum uh, so that I might uh, lead them in prayer. And then he said, then I ascended to the sama'a dunya fa'idha fiha Adamu alayhi salam. And then I saw Adam alayhi salam. And we'll, uh, we'll come back to this hadith in a minute. But then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam began his ascension through the samawat. Right? The, the heavens or the skies, and these are not paradises. These are the Samawat are not the Jannat. Okay, the Samawat are seven realms of creation that are not perceptible to us. Okay, and the first heaven is called as Sama Dunya. And the Quran says that it is the realm of the stars, so the universe as we know it. And at the end of the Sama Dunya, according to the Hadith, there is a door or gateway that Jibreel alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam reached. And after passing through this gateway, they entered into a new realm, a second heaven. Now today, astronomers and physicists, they espouse the existence of something called a multiverse. They postulate uh, different or multiple dimensions of existence. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam said, the seven heavens in relation to the kursi is like a ring thrown into a desert. The ring is like the seven heavens. Imagine throwing a ring into the desert, right? And then looking at the desert from a, like a bird's eye view. You won't even notice the ring. 
He continues, and the superiority of the Arsh over the Kursi is like the superiority of the desert over that ring. So the vast, vast majority of creation is hidden from us, even in this room. Right? So if I look at my finger, and I tell you, I can see my whole finger. Can I see my whole finger? That's what it seems like to me, but I can't see the other side of my finger. And then I can't see inside my finger. Most of my finger is inside my finger. The vast, vast majority of my finger is hidden from me. I can probably see 1% of my finger right now, less than 1% of what is right in front of my eyes. The vast, vast majority of creation is totally veiled from us. You know. The Prophet ﷺ, he saw various prophets who were in these various realms of existence. The significance of these specific prophets is very interesting. The ulama point this out, that the visions of these prophets, they point to certain Muhammadan typologies. In other words, they prefigured events in the life of the Prophet wasallam. So in the first heaven, he met Adam a.s. Adam a.s. was uh, made uh, or exiled from the garden, as it were, made hijrah, indicating that the Prophet wasallam will make hijrah from Mecca to Medina. In the second heaven, he met the two cousin prophets, Isa alayhi salam and Yahya alayhi salam. Uh, and the ulama mentioned these two prophets were persecuted during their lives. There was an attempt on the life of Isa alayhi salam, which was thwarted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the enemies of Yahya alayhi salam were able to kill him and he was martyred alayhi salam. So there's going to be assassin, assassination attempts on the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And some say 12, 13 attempts were made on his life, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Third heaven, Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf alayhi salam came into power over his brothers after being forced to make hijrah or uh, being sort of uh, exiled from his home city. And this is going to happen to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he goes to Medina and then he comes back during the conquest of Mecca and the Meccans come and they know that you know, that he could take revenge from them. So they say to him, you are a, a, a noble brother, a noble brother. And the Prophet ﷺ quotes from Surah Yusuf, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. There is no blemish on you today. Just as Yusuf ﷺ had said to his brethren. The fifth heaven, sorry, fourth heaven, Idris السلام, is probably Enoch in, in biblical tradition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, very, something very quick about Idris alayhi salam in the Quran. Basically, that's it. What quote fil kitabi Idris? Innahu kana siddiqan nabiyya wa rafa'annahu makanan aliyya. Remember in the book, Idris alayhi salam, he was truthful in the Prophet, and we raised him to a high place. And of course, wa rafa'anna laka dhikrak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, we have raised your remembrance. Your dhikr is raised. And the ulama say, this is when we raise our voice in the adhan in the world, but also his name is written on the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and other things as well. The fifth heaven, Harun alayhi salam. Harun was hated by his people and then loved by his people. So initially there was a lot of tension with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam in Mecca, but then they came to love him. Uh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As said his father on his deathbed, Amr ibn al-As said to him that there was a time, oh my son, when I hated the Prophet sallallahu so much, I couldn't even, I, 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 um, I hated him so much that I fought in many battles against him and tried to kill him. And then there came a time when I loved him so much, I could not raise my eyes to his because I was in awe of him. You know, and if he says, you ask me right now to describe him, you know, it's just, I, I, haven't, I haven't laid eyes on him in such a, uh, such a long time. Right? So completely turning the hearts. And then the sixth heaven, Musa alayhi salam, was given a sharia, right? A so comprehensive law code, and the Prophet وسلم, was given a sharia. He's the prophet like Moses. The prophet like Moses is prophesied in the Torah as it is even today. The seventh heaven, Ibrahim alayhi salam, of course, the rites of Hajj go back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And so we have a restoration of the millah of Ibrahim alayhi salam with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is the prophet of the Abrahamic restoration, the true theology 
of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the true message of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Right? So one of the things that the Jews in Medina said to the Prophet وسلم, they said that some of them said, you're a prophet. So you're, you're, it's called a, a Nevi Emet in Hebrew. It means a true prophet. Okay? And, and there's hadith that indicates, sound hadith, that they would come into the majlis of the Prophet وسلم, and they would sneeze on purpose. Because, and the hadith says, because they wanted a prophet to say, Yarhamukum Allah. And the Prophet وسلم, he would say, Allahu Yahdikum. Right? May Allah guide you. So some of them believed he was a prophet, but they said, but you're not from Bani Israel, so you cannot abrogate the Torah. And so the Quran wants to make an argument here. Right? مَا كَانَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ يَهُودِيًّا وَلَا نَصْرَانِيًّا وَلَكِنْ كَانَ حَنِيفًا مُسْلِمًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ They call Abraham, Avraham Avinu, this is how Jews refer to Abraham, our father Abraham. You know, if you, if you study systematic theology, of medieval Judaism, almost all of them say there can be no non-Jewish prophets. There can be no non-Jewish prophets. Yet one of the greatest prophets in their book, Ibrahim alayhi salam, not a Jew. Not Jewish. So this is, this is just a lie. And the Quran is pointing this out. Right? That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he is like Ibrahim in that sense. But if we look at the verses of the Mi'raj, Right? Again, these were recited by Qari Amar, may Allah preserve him, in Salat al Isha. Your companion, so by the star when it sets, your companion has neither strayed nor erred, nor does he speak out of his hawa. He never speaks, never speaks from his hawa. It is nothing but revelation reveals. Very powerful in Arabic. Right? This ithbat ba'd nafiyan. So you have this sort of affirmation after a strong negation. Allamahu shadidu al-quwa dhu mirratin fastawa. He was taught by, by one mighty in power, possessed of vigor, he stood upright. Wa huwa bil ufuk al-a'la thumma dana fatadalla fakana qaba qawsani aw adana fa'awha ila abdihi ma awha. مَا كَذَبَ الْفُؤَادُ مَا رَأَى أَفَتُ مَارُونَهُ عَلَى مَا يَرَى وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى So he says, uh, possessed of vigor, he stood upright while he was on the highest horizon. Then he drew near and came close, and he was within two bow lengths or even nearer. Then he, Allah, revealed his abd, whatever he revealed. فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى And the ulama mentioned here, خَوَاتِمُ الْبَقَرَى the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, which contains our essential aqidah, creed, was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at this station, when there's no Jibril Alayhi Salaam, without, an, uh, without angelic mediation. This is a type of interior locution he perceived without angelic mediation. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala gave these words directly into his heart, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also, the ulama mentioned the wa'ad, the promise of paradise for, for him and his ummah, and also the prayer was made fard. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, his heart did not falsify what he saw. Do you then dispute with him concerning what he sees? And indeed he saw him another time near the lot tree of the utmost boundary. And you can write volumes on these ayat, you know. So, he saw him another time near the lot tree of the utmost boundary. Near it is the garden of abode. When the lot tree was enshrouded with whatever it was enshrouded, his sight swerved not, nor did it transgress. Indeed, he saw of the signs of his Lord the greatest. Okay, so something we gather from this story is the importance of prayer. Right? The importance of prayer. An ittisal, a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as the importance of a connection to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? It's like the, uh, the story says that that uh, when uh, they came to the Sidratul Muntaha, Jibreel alayhi salam said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
but I cannot go any further. If I do, I will combust into flames. Right? And so the Prophet وسلم, it was his maqam. He has the highest maqam of all creation. So he continued by himself and some of the ulama, they, they ask interesting questions and they say, well, if Jibreel alayhi salam was going to combust, the Prophet وسلم, what about his turban and sandals? Why didn't they combust? And the answer is they are attached to the blessed person of the Prophet Anything connected has ittisal. There's connection, direct connection to the Prophet will not burn. But going back to the prayer, the greatest form of dhikr is the prayer. And we find in the hadith, I quoted earlier, at the end of the hadith uh, of Sunan al-Nasai, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنِّي يَوْمَ خَلَقْتُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فَرَضْتُ عَلَيْكَ وَعَلَىٰ أُمَّتِكَ خَمْسِينَ صَلَاةً فَخَمْسٌ بِخَمْسِينَ فَقُمْ بِهَا أَنْتَ وَأُمَّتُكَ so he says, the day I created the heavens and the earth, I enjoined 50 prayers upon you and your ummah. Five is for 50. So establish them, you and your ummah. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam. He said, innani ana Allah, la ilaha illa ana fa'budni wa aqim salat li dhikri. Indeed, I am Allah, there is no God but me. So worship me and establish the prayer for my remembrance. So this is a major tribulation of our times, is that Muslims leaving the prayer. Okay. There's, there's a metaphysical equation in the Quran. The metaph metaphysical equation is لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ So you have physical equations and you have metaphysical equations. Gratitude equals increase. Shukr equals increase. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to pray, but if we prioritize ourselves over the command of Allah, this is ingratitude. Okay? We have, you know, Muslim college students investing hours and hours of their time going out and, you know, sh shouting slogans in the streets and, and things like that. And there's a time and place for these types of things in protests, but many of these people don't even pray. You know, the actual function or rationale of the prayer is given in the Qur'an. Right? There are some scholars who take the position that every single injunction in the Qur'an has a, has a discernible, rational basis. It's not even super rational. It's, it's clearly rational. <inaudible> Indeed, the prayer prevents from indecency and sin. So even if the prayer is just perfunctory, even if you're going through motions, you still have to pray with wudu at five different times during the day, right? Uh, so if you have to do that, engaging in indecent and sinful acts becomes much, much more difficult. Okay, and after some time, you will change. The prayer is transformative. So we have to trust the process. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is tried and tested. Okay, so my advice in, in, in light of the lecture tonight is do not leave the prayer. As salatu imadu din. Right? The prayer is the quintessential pillar of the religion. According to Imam Ahmad, leaving, leaving the prayer is kufr. That you leave Islam by leaving the prayer. This is his opinion. Okay? And there's strong support for it. The Prophet ﷺ said, Bain al kufri wal iman tarku salah. Right? That between kufr and iman is leaving the prayer. This is in multiple books. Whoever leaves the prayer has disbelieved. Okay. So this is something we have to think about. You know. Some of the ulama, they ask a question. Why is Iblis a kafir? Why is Iblis, why is Shaitan a kafir? You might say, well, Shaitan does not acknowledge Allah as his Lord. But in the Quran, when Allah said to him, فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا فَإِنَّكَ رَجِيمٌ وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكَ لَعْنَةِ إِلَى يَوْمِ الدِّينِ Iblis responded, قَالَ رَبِّي فَأَنْذِرْنِي O oh my Lord, give me respite. Yoma yub'athun, until they are resurrected. Some people say Iblis doesn't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the day of Badr, what did Shaitan say to the Mushrikeen? Inni bari'um minkum. Inni ara ma la tarawna. Inni akhafullah. Wallahu shadeedul iqab. So Iblis, he saw the heavenly hosts descending at Ghazwat Badr. And he saw this. And he said to the Mushrikeen, I am free from you. I can see what you can't see. I fear Allah. Allah is shadeedul iqab. 
So shaitan knows that Allah is God and that the Prophet ﷺ is a messenger of God. He knows these things. He knows it. But the religion is not called al-ilm. The religion is not called al-ma'rifah. The religion is called al-islam. Submission. So what submits? The mind, the body, and the soul. So why is he a kafir? He disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Makes sajda to Adam. Aba wa stakbara wa kana min al-kafirin. So istakbara means to deem yourself greater. That's what it means. It's form 10. It's one of the meaning patterns of form 10 uh, in Arabic is considerative. To consider yourself kabir. To consider yourself greater than something. Right? Uh, when one does not pray, perform the salah, we, one is deeming one's own desires above that of Allah's command. Okay, so this is uh, something that's... So the prayer has a special significance, maqam, okay, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abandoning the prayer is to abandon one of the five major arkan of the religion. Okay. Um, what time is it? It's past nine. I think I'll stop at this point, inshallah. Yeah. I think there's a, you know, given, given the status of the Isra wal Mi'raj as one of the greatest miracles uh, of the Prophet sallallahu who's, who's the greatest human being, um, the question always comes up, it, was the Isra and Mi'raj prophesized in the previous books, like in the Bible and things like that? And I think the answer is probably yes, and I think I've identified some ayat, but I think it's getting too late for this. So I think maybe we'll, if there's questions, we can take some questions or... Then we can call it a night, inshallah. Yes? Um, I've heard from other uh, scholars that they don't necessarily believe that it wasn't an actual inception. I was wondering um, why they didn't think uh, Yeah. That's a good question. The question is that he's heard from other scholars. I'm not a scholar, but from scholars that that it wasn't an actual ascension. So I, I assume you mean it was an ascension in the body, an ascension. Yeah. So the, the first part of the, of the uh, night journey and ascension, uh, the Isra, uh, this, this is in, in, in body. Okay. And there's pretty much, yani, there's consensus on this. That this, is, this is the plain meaning of the text of the Quran. Asra bi abdihi means that the Prophet ﷺ was taken literally uh, from Mecca to Jerusalem. The second part, the Mi'raj, there's some ikhtilaf among the ulama whether this was a physical ascension in the body or was it a vision he had. But the vast majority, the vast, vast majority, they say that this was in, in body and in spirit. Yeah. So denying the first part, denying the Isra is, is dangerous because it's a clear-cut text, the hujjah in the Quran, like a nas, yani, that's clear in the Quran. Uh, but the mi'raj, whether it was uh, in body uh, or a body and mind, or just sort of a vision. There's a, there's a bit of ikhtilaf, but the overwhelming majority say that it's in the body as well. Yeah. yeah, so this is an idiomatic expression in Arabic. So a bow is like six feet. So two bows lengths is an expression in Arabic, which means something is very, very close, right? So that the Prophet Sallallahu was very close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now the ulama would say here that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is transcendent of space, time, and directionality, right? So there's, there's no makan. And this is, you know, this is the dominant, you know, this is Sunni aqidah. You know, this is the maturidi ash'ari, right? That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is not located in space because he's the creator of space. Okay, so... The Prophet Sallallahu he experienced the ru'ya, right? The beatific vision of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala when he was standing at the base of the Arsh. And it's not because Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala is physically anywhere. This is where the experience happened. There's no makan with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. So it's an idiomatic expression, meaning that in reality, it's very close. Like there's a hadith that says, Aqrabu yukunu al-abd min rabbihi wa huwa sajid. That the closest a servant is to his Lord is when he's in sajda. The aqrabu, that's the closest. So obviously here, the Prophet ﷺ is not talking about in terms of directionality. Or, in, you know, so, you know, if I, you know. And one of my teachers, he said that, 
uh, I might have mentioned this before, he said. He said, when Yunus السلام, was in the belly of the whale and he was making sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's closer to Allah in reality when he was there than an angel standing in the Baytul Ma'mur in the seventh heaven because he is in sajda. So in reality, he's closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So. Is what? Yeah, that's, yeah it's, this is an idiomatic expression that the Arabs would have immediately understood. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few words in the Quran that the Sahaba had to ask the poets, like the, the Bedouins, about because they had the best Arabic. Right? Like there's a word, um, what is it? I don't, I don't remember. But Sayyidina Umar, he, he, asked a, he asked a Bedouin, and he says that means attrition, to lose, like, to lose, like, um, gradually. He says, oh, okay. Which is amazing. The Quran has, yani, you know, it's uh, an, it's an ocean of of uh, of not only Arabic but like like uh, of rhetoric. You know, if a college student writes a ten-page term paper and he uses three or four sort of rhetorical devices, we say, "Oh, this guy's a smart guy." The Quran has hundreds and hundreds of rhetor rhetorical devices, right? And right now you have this, you have you know, see these neo-Orientalists that are doing really advanced research on the Quran. And they keep taking L's at every turn. They keep losing because <laughs> everything goes back to the Uthmani Codex. And they want to say that, that the Quran was written after. The Quran was assembled after the time of Sayyidina Uthman. And everything goes back to this archetype, even before that. You know? Because there was a man, uh, Wansbro, this you know, Orientalist at Soaz in London, who said that the Quran was actually written in the 8th century in Iraq by a committee. Right? And, and it's really interesting because he's like, no, no, no um, I, one man couldn't have written this. This is, this is incredible. What are you talking about? This was written by a committee of like philosophers and theologians and poets. And you're telling me one man in Arabia wrote this in the seventh century? And then they found manuscripts that are dated to the Meccan period. The Birmingham manuscript is dated to the Meccan period. And so everyone who followed this guy is just like, you can't. <laughs> There's manuscripts that date to 650. 650 of the common era. This is less than 20 years after the Prophet There's Uthmani codices that they've discovered. All of these revisionist theories are thrown out the window. Yeah. Yes, sir. Wa alaikum salam. The, the Samawat. Because the Samawat. Samawat, yeah. Okay, because you were interchangeably using heavens, so I... Yeah, I, yeah, I, I translate Samawat as heavens. Okay. But Jannat, I would... Jannat, okay. other than when he was in the, the beatific vision. Yeah, so the Quran says that, that, um, that, the, that the Jannat, they actually start at the seventh heaven. Okay. Like, where the sort of the Sidra, the base of the Sidra to Muntaha. Indaha Jannatul Ma'wa. Right. So, yeah, when I said heavens, I meant heavens, I meant the Samawat. Okay. But the Jannat, I would translate as paradises. And then a follow-up, I'm sorry, minus. <laughs> uh, a follow-up is the, um, it, it, just confirmation about the, um, what we recite in the, in the uh, Tahiyyat, right? That is a, that's like a conversation that occurs between um, uh, Jibreel alayhi salam and the Prophet alayhi salam. Is this, does that occur during the Esra? Yeah, there's, um, I don't know if there's a definitive proof text for that. Okay. I know that the ulama have mentioned it. Uh, it's a sort of a traditional sort of basis for the at Um But Allahu alam, there isn't a definitive. This is definitely how the Prophet used to pray, because the entire prayer is tawatur. We know that, right? But exactly where do things come from that are said in the prayer? Um, like their sort of primal origin. The actual origin that we know, the proximate origin, I guess, is the Prophet ﷺ. There's no doubt about that. Um, but where, where does that story come from? Some of the ulama mentioned that, that when the Prophet ﷺ, um, experienced the ru'ya, right? 
uh, he said, At-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat. And then Allah said, As-salamu alayka ayyuhal nabiyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And then the Prophet said, As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi wa salayhi wa salayhi wa salayhi wa salayhi. And then the angels, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah. Ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. Abduhu rasulullah. That's sort of the, the, the legend of it. But Allahu alam. I don't think there's a definitive text. Yes, sir. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum. Just, you had mentioned, Wa la qadra ra'ahu nazlatan ukhra. You, you, you made a mention of that ayah. If you could speak about that a little bit. I mean, it, it suggests, uh, first of all, what did he see? Who's the ra'a? Who, uh, who's that referring to? Yeah. And then, Nazlat and Ukhra gives the idea that there was a first time for there to be, because you even translated it as another time, I think. Yeah. So, I, maybe yeah. you could just comment a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So, I think most of the exegetes of the Quran, they say that... Uh, the, the, the vision that's described in these ayat is when the Prophet وسلم, he saw Jibreel alayhi salam. Okay, so he, he saw him two or three times in his actual form. So seeing him again um, uh, in, in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him. Um, but there are, other, there are other ulama who say that these verses uh, also um, speak of, maybe in addition, but they speak of the ru'ya that the, that the Prophet sallallahu saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that is amodal, that is beyond kafiyat, is beyond comprehension. There's no how to it. Um, so they do mention that, but I exactly how they deal with these specific words, if it's the latter opinion, I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's uh, the general sort of exegesis is that the Prophet sallallahu he saw Jibreel alayhi salam again in his created form, which happened again two or three times. Wallahu alam. Yes, sir. Yes, part of the night. Laylan means a part of the night, not even the whole night. And yeah. The second part is do we know anything about the seven layers of heaven, anything beyond just the, the story? Do we know any, every, anything? I mean, yeah, there's um, descriptions. I mean, we have different terms that are used for the different celestial realms, like the Malakut and the Jabarut. But these are, you know, these are technical terms that require a lot of research. So definitely we know more things about these realms, but the information comes directly from Allah and His Messenger. So, I mean, people will write different books and things like that, and people will talk, and, but, you know, it's, uh, we have to be careful to sort of you know, separate the wheat from the chaff, as it were. If Allah and His Messenger said it, then it's, this is haq, right? And people can speculate. And maybe speculation is, you know, if it's coming from a place of, of knowledge and, and a study and ijtihad, then it's, you know, uh, something that we can consider. But something that is definitively true is from Allah and His Messenger. So with, with these things, you don't have a lot of information. With the, with the ruh, even, we, you know, the Quran says, you only know a little bit about the ruh. This is a mystery. And so this sort of implication is even if we were to tell you, you wouldn't understand it. Right? Um, so. Was it true that when the Allah spoke with uh, uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum salam. Um, apologies if this question is pretty basic, um, but my what I've heard is that um, upon this night, it's a great night to like do a tons of ibadah and like to fast. Tomorrow. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. So um, I, I guess my question is like, what do you recommend um, in terms of like ibadah to do, or like how to really commemorate this night and then tomorrow in terms of like our practical application of like our you know of, of what should we do um, to really like commemorate this this next this yeah, night and good. tomorrow? That's a good question. Making a lot of salawat upon the Prophet sallam, is always good, but certainly on of and you know the twenty seventh of Rajab. This is the dominant opinion, right? There's there's no there's by no means a a total consensus. But most of the ulama say 27th of Rajab is later to the Isfara Miraj. So we use it to commemorate this great event. So I would increase in the salawat upon the Prophet You can do, you know, additional uh, nathila prayers. You know, um, all of these things are permissible. This is not, you know, bid'ah or anything like that. This is, uh, these are good practices. Um, 
We're not adding anything to the religion. Um, and renew intentions, right? Renew intentions not to miss prayer. So that's the main sort of message I wanted to get across, is that this story really highlights the importance of prayer, so connection in general. Connection to Allah, connection to his messenger. These two things. It's really highlighted in the story. So renew intentions. Renew intentions to follow the sunnah, right? Uh, to, to dedicate oneself to the book of God. The Quran is an absolute bahar. It is an ocean that is without a shore. It is unbelievable. And we scratch the surface. And I'm telling you right now, these non-Muslim scholars, you know, they're, you're, you're going to see a massive influx of people becoming Muslim. Because you have these people studying the Quran to debunk it, and that completely changes their hearts. And then they have a, lot, a large following that will become Muslim. This is happening now. You know, there's a lot of submarines. They're called submarines. That's what uh, a great uh, scholar in the UK calls them. So these are like, like Muslim, non, uh, sorry, these are intellectuals that on the outward are sort of living a, or appear to be non-Muslim, but they're actually Muslim in their hearts, but they're hiding their iman because, you know, there's sort of pressures from family and career and things like that. But they come to the masjid to do their prayers. They, they fulfill all of the rites. They do all of the thought. Um, so, you know, I would engage with the Qur'an at a, at a deeper level. Read some tafsir, basic tafsir of the Qur'an. Study Arabic a little bit. Even a little bit, you know, is better than nothing. Even if you have to review and, you know, it's good to do that. Inshallah. Go ahead, brother. My question, my question was, yes, and, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke with uh, the Prophet, and he mentioned that you had to pray 50 prayers, right? Is it true that when the Prophet went back, he spoke to Musa, and Musa said to him, your people, are not, they're not, your people will not pray, go back to Allah, mm -hmm. you know? This is mentioned in the hadith, yes. So, I, I mean, so it's like, I mean, Allah knows that, you know, Allah knows everything, so Allah knew that we're not, we're not going to pray 50 prayers, right? Of course. So the, 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 He's coming back and forth. What's, what's your interpretation about that? About you know, Allahu alam. This it seems, was like forty, then thirty, then twenty. Yeah. they came down to five at the end. This seems to emphasize the importance of the prayer. You know, uh, so this is an interesting sort of. There's something similar to this in the Torah, right? When Ibrahim, according to the Torah, he's he he prays to God to save the city of Sodom because. He said, even if there's 50 people there, will you spare the city? And then God tells him, yes. He said, what about 40? He said, yes. What about 30? Yes. So this is an interesting way. So the Quran is first, you know, first and foremost is speaking to the Arab, right? And the Arabs were merchants, and they understand this kind of bargaining tactic. And the Quran makes reference to tijara. It uses the term tijara. First and foremost is speaking to the Arab. And the Arab is going to take the religion to the world. So that really has to settle into the mind, the culture, the psyche of the Arab, right? So this is a way in which it, the Arab will really remember the importance of something, that the prayer is important, that this was a bargain, and we get the reward of 50 even if we do five, right? And then there's a strong warning not to be like the previous Umam who would fight, why do you vex and insult me while you know I'm the messenger of God? This is what the Quran quotes Musa salam. In the Torah, it's ten times worse. They want to kill him in the Torah. That's what it says. I'm not making this up. They want to stone him in Exodus chapter 17, verse 4. They're ready to kill him. Right? So this is why Musa salam says, if your people are anything like my people, you're not going to do it. Even at five, he said, they're not going to do it. And he said, I, I, have, I have shame before my Lord. And there's another lesson here. Of course Allah knows everything. It's like Allah questions there's hadith, like Allah will ask someone on the Day of Judgment, why did you do this? Of course Allah knows. The point is for this thing to be recorded for our own edification. So we'll gain something for it. You know, like the man who said to his sons, burn my body, incinerate me when I die. I don't want to face Allah. I don't want Allah to be able to reconstruct me. And this belief is kufr technically. The man was ignorant. And so Allah reassembled him on the Yom al Qiyamah. Why did you, why did you tell your sons to incinerate you? I didn't want you to be able to, right? And then Allah forgave him, because apparently, and there's obviously there's a story about this. He he cried tears for the sake of the tears. Allahu uh, Akbar. I have another point also uh, in regards to prayers. 
Mm. I personally feel that, you know, prayer is not a command. Prayer is a blessing. It's an absolute blessing. Because mm. in this materialistic world, right, we live in, mm -hmm. if our boss came to us and said, you know what, I want to have a meeting with you. Mm -hmm. I want to have a, pr the CEO of a company comes and says, I want to have a, a meeting with you. Come to my office. So that employee, that guy goes, wow, he's, he's, I'm going, wow, I'm being the boss of the company. I'm going to go to his office. He goes to his office, right? He talks to the CEO. The CEO says, you know what, you want a raise? You want, you want, you, you want a promotion? Do this for me. Work hard. Do this. Do that, right? Mm -hmm. You'll get a raise. So then we all work hard. You know, we work day and night. You know, we struggle. We work seven days a week, you know. We, we, we miss everything and we just work hard to make money. Mm -hmm. But you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? When he, he, he personally came and, and asked the Prophet to come, right? If he wanted, he could have told the Prophet through Revelation, right? Through the proper angel, uh, angel, the angel Jibreel, through, the, through Revelation. He never did that. He wanted to speak to him personally and say, listen, I'm giving you a gift. Prayer, salat, pr it's a blessing. If you do this, I'll, I'll give rizak, I'll give you blessing in your life, right? Mm. So in a way, it's a blessing. And, and unfortunately, many, like you said, and many people don't value prayer, right? Definitely they, a blessing. You know, they, they do, they give lectures and they, they do all this stuff. And then while the people are praying and they're, they're missing their prayer, right? I mean, it's, it's like, it's like prayer is the most, it's a, it's a fundamental thing, right? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a basic, mm -hmm. basic, you know, and it's a blessing. So I think what, what this whole night was all about, it's all about, you know, the value of our prayers, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I agree. Prayer is a blessing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also the sovereign Lord of the universe. And He, ma he makes commandments. It's so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands, we say, we hear it, we affirm. It's a command, yeah. but it's, all, it's, a, it's, a, what about say it's, it's a blessing. All of the commands are blessings. Okay. Of course. Yes, of course. But people kind of interpret it as, oh, I, I, it's like, oh, I have to do it. Like a, it's like a yeah. If, if, peop if people don't want to pray or they consider it a burden, then I think, they're in, I think they have a false conception of the religion. A cultural, a cultural. Something is, there's something with them. Yeah. And a lot of times these poor people, they have, there, there's something, there's some existential crisis, it's a small thing, it's in their heart and they're afraid to tell people, you know. And uh, you know, this would happen in the pre-modern world, somebody would like apostate. And then, you know, they'd jail the person, and then they'd bring a group of ulama. And in five minutes, that person is completely, so, oh, okay. No one ever explained it to me, right? You know, so there was a, <laughs> there was a, a, a pseudo-messiah named Shabtai Svi, right, who claimed to be the messiah. This was in the 17th century. And he said, I'm the messiah, and this is a global movement. And he said, I'm going to depose the Ottoman Sultanate. So he was captured. This is treason. This is Khayana. They're going to execute him, right? And so uh, they said to him, you know, um, this is Khayana. We're going to execute you. Or you can make Tawbah and renounce your claim, right? And so they actually brought in some ulama. And uh, the Ottoman, you know, ulama, they were like, I mean, they know like Arabic, Hebrew, and Greek, and Latin, and Farsi, and they knew the Torah and the Gospel, and the Quran, obviously, and the, and the Sunnah. And like they, con they converted this man. He became Muslim. This was like a global movement. They thought this man was the, the Messiah. You know? um, but yeah, sometimes the, the point is that sometimes it's, a, it's just a little thing, and people should have recourse to ulama. And we have technology now, so that's a good thing. They can, they can do that. But people should speak up. People shouldn't be afraid. But yeah, if the, if, the, if the religion is making you into a bad person, if the religion is making you into like a grouchy person or a mean-spirited person uh, or someone who's highly, highly judgmental, someone who's, you know, you have to sort of walk on eggshells around. Because the Prophet ﷺ was exactly the opposite of that. People felt totally at ease. He had such rifq and lean that you just, when, you, when he talked to you, you think, he loves me, he loves me. Why does he love me so much? This is what people would, how would react when, they would, when he would speak to them. He loves me more than anybody. Right? Um, so, uh, that, so that's right religion. That's the sunnah. Right? Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum. So, um, alaikum. there are many miracles in Quran, and I think this is one of the biggest ones. Um, so, as Muslims, 
um, should we we all believe uh, it's happened but is there an explanation always behind either physically or metaphysically for all these miracles maybe like we can explain today or maybe in the future maybe as technology grows or maybe here in uh, in the hereafter are we going to like see the explanation of of all these miracles or is it because Allah is all powerful he can just do whatever uh, he wishes or is there always some explanation yeah i mean there may there may be a discernible explanation like i mentioned earlier that that um, if we apply quantum mechanics to Newtonian physics, then in theory, it would be possible to walk on water and move through walls. It's possible that, that certain awliya or anbiya were taught this type of knowledge. So what they're doing is actually according to natural law, but it seems like it's breaking natural law. But in reality, there's no break of natural law. It's just a break of customary physics. So that's one way to explain it. The other way to explain it is, indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe in God. He has power over all things. And that's not an irrational belief. Right? We believe that this universe came into being. Everything comes down to basically cosmology. Uh, yeah, faith. But, but faith is, is, is a word that is very much sullied today by, by academia, by our culture. When people think of the word faith, they think, of, um, they think of belief without evidence. That's how Dawkins actually defines it. One of these new, you know, the, the head of the snake, the new atheist. But a better word is confidence. If you say, I have confidence in Allah, it has, it has a better sort of um, uh, connotation. Confidence means faith. Con with fides, faith. I have faith in Allah. Confidence in Allah. Yeah, I mean, because it, no, confidence is a Latin word. It's a classical word. It means that I believe in God for a reason. There's a reason why I believe in God. It's not just blind faith, because we're not allowed to have blind faith. This is called taqlid. And, you know, this is something that's denounced in the Quran. Ibrahim alayhi salam says to, to his people, uh, What are you worshipping? He wants them to think about, why are you worshipping these idols? Where is your aql? Well, this is what we found our, for, our fathers doing. So what? You, you, you have to believe what you believe. Right? Faith has a foundation. Right? Yeah. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, everyone has confidence in something. So everyone has faith in something. So an atheist believes the universe came from nothing. And if you ask them how, they say, I don't know, I just have confidence. I have faith. Everybody has faith. They, they can't tell you how. They can't explain it to you from a Newtonian uh, uh, scientific standpoint or even from a quantum standpoint. How does something come from nothing? How does it happen? They can't. They don't know. But I, it happened. That's what they say. I have confidence. And maybe one day we'll, we, we'll know how. Maybe one day, like the brother said, maybe on Yom Al-Qiyamah we'll know how. What's the difference? Everyone believes in something. Everybody believes in something. So, so I think we're going to end at 9.30, inshallah. We do have one last question. Oh, yes, yes. Go ahead. It's 9.30 already. Yeah, alhamdulillah. No, no. I thought you texted him. Sorry. Oh, no. I okay. didn't check my phone. You said you are going to text me. Yeah, no, that's no, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so, are there any other references of uh, the buraq being used by um, the previous uh, anbiya? You know, Qadi Iyad in the Kitab shifa which is a Mubarak text, you should have Kitab shifa in your book, in your bookshelf at home. He mentions some, some traditions. I don't know how strong they are, but there's some traditions that he mentioned. And he's a great scholar, a jurist, right? Um, and he collects some of these traditions, some of these athar, that mention that the buraq was used by previous anbiya, like Ibrahim alayhi salam. You know, Allahu alam. Um, other ulama say that the buraq was only for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. This is why he was created. But then the hadith says, because the buraq, when it saw the Prophet Sallallahu it shied away from him. So then Jibreel Alayhi Salaam, he sort of censured the buraq and said, no one more exalted has ever ridden upon you than this man. Because when, when people would, and animals would come into the presence of the Prophet, they would be like awestruck by him. Ooh, like this. You know. So he shied away and then he, so based on this hadith, it, it does seem indeed that previous anbiya, some of the ulama mentioned like, 
Ibrahim alayhi salam, he would sort of travel between Mecca with where Ismail alayhi salam was and, and uh, Palestine where Ishaq lived and he would use the Barak. Allahu alam. Of Barak? Not the animal, no. I think when Isa alayhi salam in the New Testament prophesizes the son of man, he says, so a great human being is coming, like insan al-kamil is coming. He says he'll, he'll come like lightning, for his lightning comes from the, for his lightning shines from the east, comes from the west and shines to the, shines upon the east, so, shows the, so shall the coming of the son of man be. I think this might be a reference to the Prophet wasallam coming to the Temple Mount. And there's a, the vision of Daniel also, where he, he, see, he sees someone he calls Bar Inash, Kabar Inash, an exalted human being and his nation, but he's talking about the human being, and he says he was brought near before the Ancient of Days. And I think this is a reference to the, like the Uruj or the Mi'raj of the Prophet wasallam. And the evidence works very well. That it's, it's, that it's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Because the Jews have sort of a response, the Christians have a response. Both of them are highly incoherent, especially with all due respect, with, especially the Christian interpretation. It just doesn't work at all. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah uh, khairastad. It's very nice to have you back at MCC. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for your questions and your attention. Alhamdulillah. We have had more than 100 viewers online uh, watching, and many of them are your online fans, uh, Dr. Ali. They're asking if you have any, any books that you're working on or anything they can kind of see. You know, I was working on a book, but I started doing podcasts, and I'm thinking it seems kind of redundant. <laughs> but that's not a good way of thinking, I think. So... Uh, it's kind of on a back burner. But I was working on a book on Islamic Christology. So basically, what is the sort of position of the Messiah in the Quran? Who is the Messiah? What is the Messiah? And then also a sort of um, refutation of Jewish and Christian ideas of the Messiah. So I'm working on that for a long time. Uh, so the problem with me is I write something and then six months later I don't like it. And then I'm too lazy to revise it. <laughs> so I'll write something else. And then six months later, I don't like that. So then after five years, I don't like any of it. And it's 300 pages. So that's a problem. You know. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Tawfiq, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.